want you to imagine that this is a beautiful morning in May. The sun is just beginning to shine. And the sky is turning rosy and pink. And you are standing by the water, and it is rippling gently. The birds are tweeting in the trees. The leaves are rustling in your air. And the world is filled with beauty. I am standing by this river on May 21st, 2003. But I do not see the beauty, and I do not feel the air tickling my skin. I do not sense anything other than the despair of having endured four years, nine months of living hell in an abusive relationship. And I stand at the edge of the water, and I imagine releasing the hold that gravity has upon my body and letting myself fall into the water and sink to the muck and the mire below. And I desperately want to do this. I have desperately wanted to do this for months, for years of this relationship. And I can't. I have lost everything, and my life is one big lie. It is the lie of this man who had me believe that, you know, I was on this road to um, happiness ever after, when really I was on the road to hell. And in all of the lies that my life has become, I hold on to one lie. And it is that lie that keeps me standing on earth. And it is that I love my daughters. I have two daughters. And for the past four months, they don't know where I am. They don't know what's happened to me because I have disappeared. This man has fled Calgary with the promise of leaving the country, and he's going to let me go when he is gone from Canada. And I don't care. I go with him because I just want him to be away from my daughters. I go with him because I mean nothing, and I am his. And on this morning, I once again choose to not kill myself. Because to kill myself would be to make a lie of this love that is so true. And I cannot condemn my daughters to live with the lie that I do not love them. And so I turn and I walk away from the river. And I walk back to the room where he is sleeping and we have been hiding for these past four months. And as I walk towards the room, a miracle drives up in a blue and white police car. And two officers get out and they walk into the room and they take this man away. And I am given the miracle of my life. Now, I am a little catatonic. And I am a little stunned when I look at the devastation around me. I have lost everything. I have lost my home, my life savings, my job, my, my self-esteem, my sense of worth. And I have lost the two beings I love the most in the world, my daughters. I have 72 cents in my pocket. I have a few clothes, and I have my trusty golden retriever who has gone through this journey with me. And I don't know what to do. And I do the only thing I can think of at this moment in time, and that is to call my sister, who lives an hour away. And I'm very blessed with my family, and she and her husband come and get me. And they take me to their home. The next morning after his arrest, I wake up, and I realize that I have just been given a miracle. And miracles are gifts, and they are not meant to be ignored. And with that miracle, I am given the promise of living in joy. And while I am broken, and very, very broken, and very broke, I, I know that, my, that I must live in joy. And so I choose joy. That Sunday, my sister takes me to church with her, and I just follow along because I don't know what else to do. And I meet a, a woman who tells me about a group of people who every Tuesday morning meet to make sandwiches in the bottom of the church. And these sandwiches are going with another woman who has a scooter and she has disabilities and she volunteers her time all the time to do this. And they go down to the east end of Vancouver and are given out to the lost souls who wander those streets. Now I know a lot about being a lost soul in this, and I also know a lot about volunteering. 
Because all my life, I have volunteered. From being, you know, as a little girl, I would do walkathons with my father and raise funds for different charities. I, school book editor, uh, newspaper editor, I always volunteered. And so I decide on that Tuesday morning to get on my sister's bike and ride to the church and start making sandwiches. And while I'm there and I am connected to this community of people who have this joint vision of what it means to give. Because when you ha believe you have nothing left to give, really, that's the best time to give. And within me, I, I didn't believe I had anything to give. And so I began to give. And as I made these sandwiches, I imagined these, these, these people, these, these individuals on the streets of Vancouver taking the sandwich and what would happen when it went into their body. And I decided that I couldn't just fill it with ham and cheese and lettuce. I had to fill it with love. Because in that moment in time, I was so incredibly grateful for this opportunity to reclaim and restore my life. And while I still didn't know what I was going to do or happen, and my daughters were still angry with me, I knew that I had to share love. And so with each pass of the knife, I imagined that love was going into those sandwiches, and that then when that person on the street bit into that sandwich, they would feel that love. And in that love, we would be connected. I continued to do this work, and eventually my courage grew and my confidence grew because I'd received such affirmation from the people in this community. And so I went with this woman, Ellen, to the east end of Vancouver, and I began to walk the streets with her, giving out these sandwiches. And I discovered again that it is in that human connection that we see each other, not as the labels we carry, not as a junkie or as an addict or as a prostitute or as an abused woman, but as human beings on this journey of our life. And really, volunteering, I mean, it wasn't about the good deeds we were doing. It was an act of love. It is always, first and foremost, an act of love. And as I handed out the sandwich, I smiled, and I gave love with that sandwich. I continue to do this because ultimately a smile is what connects us heart to heart. Along with this, I really did want to understand what had happened to me in this relationship. So I went online to understand and to find information, and I found a forum where people who had had these encounters of this not-so-nice kind would meet, and I found information that helped me. And I found, again, this community of people willing to share their experiences and their hope and their strength and all the things they had learned on their journeys to encourage me to share mine, to volunteer what I had learned so that we could all heal together. And so that's what we did. And in this virtual room of the, the, the internet forum, I began to give back more and more and more. Eventually, I actually began to find that I could love myself because I still desperately needed to reclaim and heal my relationship with my daughters. After 18 months of living in North Van, I came back to Calgary and my daughters moved in to the home with me again. And we began to restore so much of what was lost. In the process of this, I began to write my book. And I have to tell you, I did not want to write the first part about what he had done, because seriously, I didn't want to have to revisit what he had done. What I wanted to understand is where had I gone? What had happened to me that I could go so far from my course and my belief and my love of life that I would desert my daughters? And so I began to write. And I wrote and I wrote. And eventually my book was ready for publication, and at the same time, my daughters and I took a program, a personal development program called Choices, and the healing continued, and it grew, and it got bigger and bigger. And in that process, we began to volunteer as a family in this program so that we could be part of miracles happening in other people's lives, too. Whoops. And in that, the reality for us was, for me in particular, was that love has no motive. I mean, there was no motive for this other than that I knew in my heart of hearts that I had to keep giving the one thing that is limitless in this world, and that is love. 
And the only way that I knew how to do it was to keep volunteering my love without strings, without anything attached to it other than love. Because ultimately, love is all that we have to hold on to. When I was in the depth of that relationship, I was holding on to fear so desperately that love didn't exist. And the reality is love, ne love never quit existing. It was my belief in love that had quit. At the same time as my book was published and, and my daughters and I went through this program, I also began to work at the homeless shelter. And I discovered there that, again, love is all that matters. Love is all that exists. We have pain and suffering and turmoil and all those things in our world, but love is all that connects us. One day, I was on the second floor of the DI, which is a big open area where you can sit and eat and make, you know, make sandwiches, in fact. But you can watch TV, and you can do all these things. And I'm walking across the floor, and this man walks up to me, and he's very tall. And he walks up very purposefully, and he stands looking down at me, and I look up at him, and he says, can I ask you a question? And I said, sure. And he said, do you always smile? <laughs> I, I smiled, and I looked at him, and I said, yeah, I do. I have nothing to not smile about. And he said, oh, well, you touch me. Here, and he pounded his heart. And he turned, and he walked away. And I thought, wow, it is just a smile. And yet, to that man, it was a connection. It was a human connection that stripped away the label homeless, that stripped away all the other labels he might be carrying, and had the two of us see each other heart to heart. Ultimately, I kept moving forward, and it came to this place that I knew that once upon a time, I tried to take a shortcut to happiness. Prince Charming drove up in, on his big red charger. It was actually a red Ferrari. And uh, I got in, and I got lost on this road to hell. And the reality is that we all get lost sometimes. We all fall down. We all make mistakes. It is not the falling down that necessarily kills us. It's the staying there. For me, getting back up meant giving. It meant digging deep into my core, going back to my roots, going back to that place where I found my worth and my value was in a sandwich that I could hand out with a smile and love. It was in the sharing of my hope, my strength, my experience with people who had had a similar experience in a community where we were all committed to healing, to creating more of what we wanted in our lives so that we could all experience joy and love, and that sense of wonder that when we wake up on a May morning and we stand beside a river and the water is flowing gently, we no longer want to throw our bodies into the water and sink beneath the muck. What we want is to flow into the wonder of life, to be part of the human race flowing and enjoying all that the world has to offer. And I know that in my journey, that today I love my life. And in fact, with both my daughters, we know that ultimately that event, those circumstances that were really awful, but they were just a part of our life. They are not our life. And for all of us, it is that we have moments in time that things happen that will bring us down. But we can stand back up again. And we can find the courage and the strength and the commitment to give. And in our giving, we receive so much more than what we give. Because regardless of where we are in life, all there is to hold on to is love. And all that we can leave behind us is love. And in that love is the possibility of making a world of difference. Thank you.